right, there we go. Okay, we're good now. All right. Hello and welcome to this evening's uh, episode of the Sonic Cinema Movie Chat. My name is Brian Scuttle and you can find my written work at www.sonic-cinema.com and you can listen to the Sonic Cinema podcast on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Google, and Spotify. Uh, the piece we start off with was The Death of Jonathan Kent by John Williams from his score for Superman the Movie directed by Richard Donner, and I thought it would be an appropriate way to begin this uh, this stream tonight because we are going to be talking about the life and career of Richard Donner, who 
just passed away yesterday at the age of 1991, or at the age of 91. Um, in a way, uh, it does feel like a father figure passed away in Richard Donner, and he was somebody who was certainly influential to a generation of uh, filmmakers. And I mean, basically every person who has ever directed a comic book movie cites uh, Superman the movie as an influence on them. Join me to talk about uh, Richard Donner tonight is a friend of mine who's been on the podcast before, and I uh, and this is his first time on the chat. Um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Phil Faso. Thank you very much for joining me tonight. Oh, thank you so much for having me. You know, I you're well aware that The Omen is by far my favorite horror movie, and uh, I, I was thinking about yesterday after we had talked. When I was thinking about Richard Donner, just how much his movies from The Omen to Superman to Goonies to The First Lethal Weapon, like cover a 10 year span of my childhood. And they were all formative in part of why I became such a movie fan and especially a horror fan. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And uh, I mean, I was, you know, it's, it's funny because so later on in the year, uh, Phil and I've actually already talked about, we had talked about, uh, as early as last year of doing a uh, podcast on the Omen trilogy this year in uh, honor of the original movie's 45th anniversary. It was funny, we both ended up uh, watching the Omen last night and sort of paying in a, in our own ways, paying respects to uh, Richard Donner. And um, I was already going to watch the Omen this month anyways, so being able to, uh, tie it into a celebration of Donner and as well as that ad purpose of watching it for the sake of a future podcast record was appropriate. And you, you'd messaged me uh, that you, you were like, Oh, I really wish we were recording the podcast tonight so that we could um, talk about Richard Donner. And I'm like, well, would you like to join me on the screen tomorrow night? And it's like, yes, absolutely. And uh, this, it, it just worked out that way. And uh, it was, is this is, you know, it was, we'll, we'll get into the omen, but, you know, Richard Darn's been one of those filmmakers who he's always been one of my favorites. And it goes back mainly for me to his collaborations with Mel Gibson and the uh, Lethal Weapon movies and Conspiracy Theory and Maverick. And it's just been absolutely, there aren't a lot of celebrity deaths that get get to me. And there really aren't a whole lot that really affect me on an emotional level. I think the last one that really did was uh, Carrie Fisher uh, a few years ago. And part of that was because of the fact that she was in the middle of record of filming the sequel trilogy for Star Wars. But it also boiled down to the fact that Star Wars is such a fundamental part of my uh, childhood and my life. And this one, this one really has, this one really made me sad when I first read about it. And uh, it's because of how formative, uh, like you said, formative uh, that Donner is to my life as a movie watcher and as a lover of film. And uh, just, just, I always held out hope that we would be getting one more Richard Donner film after uh, he he hadn't directed for fifteen years, and it it just really makes me sad that we're not going to get that. Well, it's funny because, like, uh, I guess a couple months ago, I was at my dad's house and just on the couch, flipping through channels with my brother, and we found Timeline, right? Yeah. Timeline is not one of his best regarded movies. You know, it's not, you know, you're not going to think of when you think Richard Donald's big stuff, the stuff that changed the industry, the stuff yeah. that was the formative stuff of people's childhoods. But watching that movie a couple months ago, I had the same reaction I had the first time I saw it years and years ago when I had, I guess it was on DVD years, ages ago. And I'm like, you know what? There's a lot to like in this movie. That's my mm -hmm. first thought. And then my second thought was, 
I've never really seen a Richard Donner movie that I didn't like that didn't have some stuff in it that was fun or likable, you know? He never really yeah. put a bad movie per se because he was a really, really talented director and so versatile. Like, mm -hmm. you think Superman's a comic book movie. The Roman's a horror movie, even though he doesn't think it was, but we'll talk about that later. Um, yeah. Lethal Weapon's an action movie. You know, you have Maverick, which is a Western. Goonies is this kid's adventure. You know, they're all like spread out all over the place, and all of them have his indelible touch on them. And you can watch it and say, wow, this is a Richard Donner movie, and Donner's got some great stuff going on here, as always. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think that the thing that's so, one of the things that I think is so unique about Donner as a filmmaker is that he doesn't. You know, when you usually think of great filmmakers, you usually think about them in terms of having a great style or having great themes that they explore from time and time again and great knack for a particular genre. And Donner really doesn't have that. He really does, he really does remind me of like some of the old Hollywood filmmakers. Like he will have thrived in the golden age of Hollywood sure. within the studio system. He would have had a career along the, and he really did kind of have a career along the lines of, say, a Michael Curtiz. And um, it's, but the thing is, it's like, what makes Donner so, what makes Donner's best films his best films, and even what makes his lesser films enjoyable is the fact that he plays to the, authenticity uh he he builds an authenticity to the world he's telling this story in whether it's superman whether it's the omen whether it's lethal weapon whether it's something like maverick or even timeline and i mean you're you, i absolutely agree with you where it's like timeline is certainly not one of his better movies but it's still enjoyable because of what donner wants to do with it and what he brings to it he's he brings a sense of fun to it and just a genuine talent for telling telling his escapist stories. Well, look, Paul Walker is not a great actor <laughs> by any means, all right? Jamal no. Butler is certainly not. I mean, he's great in 300. He's good in action flex, but certainly not a great actor's actor by any means, right? Mm -hmm. You could have had that in the hands of some schlock director, with those, even with those two guys, and it could have ended up a sci-fi movie. Yeah. Richard Donner made it a legitimate movie with a good plot, you know, a good story, and I invested in the characters, and it was fun, you know? Now, I will say, I do reserve the right to change my mind about Donner not making a good film after I've seen The Toy. Um, Once I've seen The Toy, I can, I will reserve the right to change my mind on that if I can. So you have to, with, with The Toy, I mean, I'm not really defending it, but you have to understand that that is a product of its time. Yeah. Where have a kid owning a black guy as a toy in today, you'd never get that movie made. Oh, it's no. Not, in Hollywood, forget about it. With a name director, never going to happen. <laughs> but again, in the times, that, that sort of humor was acceptable. You know? Yeah. It's not a great flick by any means. But I mean, even there, I mean, look at Richard Pryor. If you want to talk Donna and Richard Pryor, Look at Richard Pryor in Superman 3, all right? Mm -hmm. Superman 3 is a mess because it's a Superman movie. It's not really a Superman movie. It's more like a, it's, it's a Richard Pryor comedy movie that they jammed Superman into, right? Yes. And again, don't get me wrong, Richard Pryor is doing a shtick, but even as far as your shtick goes in that movie, it's <laughs> not fun. It's not funny. Donna mm -hmm. even manages in what is pretty much not a great film with the toy to get a really good performance out of Richard, out of, um, out of um, Richard Pryor because he knew how to handle Pryor, you know? Yeah. Much better than Richard Lester did. So. <laughs> yeah. No, and uh, it, yeah, it's, man, re, you know, because I, I kind of enjoyed, you know, the funny thing is it's like I didn't grow up watching Superman. Like I, that was not necessarily the Donner movie I watched more as much growing up as a kid. That was more the Goonies. But when I finally saw Superman, really saw the movie as an adult, it's it really just it, you know it 
it blew me away. And this was really at the start of the modern comic book uh, run with Spider-Man, with X-Men. And you can see why you can see why Superman casts such a long shadow over the modern comic book movie landscape. But you can also see how, like, I was, I was thinking about it um, last night and then this morning I was finally catching up with the most recent episode of Loki. And, I mean, even the be- even some of the best Marvel movies, I don't, as much as, like, people making those movies point to uh, Superman the movie is such an inspiration to them, it's like it's hard to find too many of them that really do uh, capture that authenticity of the story the way Richard Donner did with that first Superman movie. Well, and here's why it was, first off, unlike you, I had the privilege of seeing the first Superman in a theater in Mm. 1978 as a kid. My mom took me and my brother. I don't think my sister was born. I think she was pregnant with my sister at the time. So we got to see Superman on the big screen. And it was like, for a kid who was, I had been six years old at the time, it was mind-blowing. Oh, I can imagine. It was just like, holy smokes, this guy's flying. How, <laughs> I, 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 and I got so invested, because especially because I was young and it was easier then, to just get wrapped up and think that I was really watching the guy flying, you know? Like, mm-hmm. and again, it goes back to that clip you sent me yesterday, the YouTube clip. Right? I've heard Richard Donner tell a story numerous times over the decades about verisimilitude. Yeah. Making it feel like it's real, like it's it's verifiably, it's something you can assimilate, it's something you can associate with, because it doesn't come across as, hey, this was made for the screen. It comes across as, hey, this guy's really flying, you know? Yeah. And no, I, I, yeah. That, that made a little difference with Superman. Superman was Superman at the time. I don't think people realize this was a huge risk. Like nothing like that had ever been done before, you know? Mm-hmm. And they trust in the guy who has had one big hit. He's made a few movies before that and did a bunch of television in the 60s. But really, like the only was his coming out part. Mm-hmm. And the only was the reason he got Superman. You know, so you're taking a guy who was not, you know, this big special effects guy. I don't know. I guess you could say Lucas at that point, but you really didn't have like you didn't really have directors outside of like even Kubrick, if you want to look at 2001. I mean, there's not really a guy who you go, oh, that's a sci-fi director, you know? Yeah. Um, so you're taking a guy and you're plunking him down with a bunch of special effects. You have all kinds of stuff going on. And if that had been done poorly, it would have crumbled. And mm-hmm. you would have the, the, the comic book movie universe today wouldn't be what it was without that, you know? Yeah. No, absolutely. And, uh, you know, the, the, the thing is, it's like, I will give... I, I will give the all kinds credit for two things. One, I will give them credit for funding Orson Welles to trial, which I just talked about in the Sonic Cinema podcast, and I absolutely love. And two, for allowing Richard Donner to cast Christopher Reeve as Clark Kent and Superman. Because if it if you don't have the combination of Richard Donner and Christopher Reeve that Superman movie does not work. No. And he is so, and Reeve is so good. I mean, even in some of the later movies, he has his moments, but especially in that first one, he is so good at convincing you not only that Superman exists in this world that Donner's created, but also that people would not catch on to the fact that he and Clark Kent are one the same, except for the hair and the glasses. Yeah. <laughs> but I think that when I look at Donner's Superman film, you know, Donner was perfect for that because I've always thought that Donner was an optimist as far as a Yeah. You know, which is why I love Zack Snyder. I love most of his films. I think they're, you know, I know he has his critics, and I, I agree with a lot of stuff the critics say. I still enjoy his stuff, except for his Marvel, his uh, DC films, because Zack Snyder's a pessimist. Zack Snyder's not a happy ending type of guy, you know? Mm-hmm. And that's, you know, that's my big problem with the way Superman's portrayed. You want to make him gritty and all that, that's fine, but that's not my Superman. My Superman 
is the one that flew onto the screen, toward the screen out in the audience in 1978 when I was in that theater with my mom and brother. Yeah. I mean, even even the fact is, it's like even somebody like, uh, you know, he's he's completely indefensible now, but I mean, Brian Singer, when he did Superman Returns, I mean, he it's very obvious that he is about he he's inspired by the Richard Donner film to the point of basically doing a remake of it. Yeah. And Brandon Routh does a good job as Superman. It just feels like fan fiction. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and that's my that's always been my biggest problem with Superman Returns, where it's like it just it feels it feels like Brian Singer basically just it it almost it, it's not quite the same thing, but it almost feels like Gus Van Zandt's shot for shot remake of psycho where it's like oh hey we'll just do the same thing they did except you will do it just a bit different well down, um, to, down to the fact that the driving force for lex Luthor in superman returns goes back to real estate again just like the first yeah time. exactly and you know I, and i don't want to get too off topic but kate bosworth was a terrible lois lane I don't know why they chose her for that role. <laughs> she's not, you know, especially because you got Ralph, who really did a great job of basically playing Christopher Reeve's version of Superman, you know? Yeah. And you have Kate Bosworth, who's nothing like Margot Kidder. She's not snappy. She's not witty. You know, it just didn't play off well. No. I wonder, you know, and the thing is, it's like, I kind of wonder if... Uh, I kind of wonder if that if Spacey might have been involved with that casting because of the fact that I think wasn't she in the Bobby Darren biopic that he directed yeah, a few years absolutely was, yeah. before? So I mean, it's like I, it had to have been something like that because yeah, there there are so many other talented actresses of that age at that time that you could have easily seen as Lois Lane. Yep, and they didn't cast one of them. And like Kate Bosworth just is not that actress. She's just so, terribly miscast in that movie. It's, it just drags the whole film down. Yeah. Not, not that there's a, not a bunch of other things that drag that film down, but yeah, <laughs> it's not, not it. But uh, so I, so we can, so um, I will say uh, we, we can go ahead and Go ahead and talk about uh, The Omen, which is the movie that both you and I ended up watching last night uh, in in honor of Richard Donner. And I know it is your favorite film, and I think it's your favorite horror film. Definitely. And I will, I will completely admit, it had been a while since I'd seen The Omen, and I'm so glad that I finally revisited it because, oh my God, that movie is... That that movie is certainly upper tier horror. <laughs> oh, it's next level stuff. And I, I, well, first off, I hope that this doesn't stop us from doing our Omen trilogy down the line somewhere. So I don't want to get too involved with the Omen because yeah. I have some stuff for that. But I do want to go into a few things first off. The, the one thing that I found out years and years later, and it was it must have been twenty years after I saw it for the first time. Must have been around 2000 when I got the DVD. Was when I was watching the documentaries on it, and Richard Donner was saying, "Hey, listen, I took this because I said, well, if I play this as a straight horror movie, it's not going to work for me, and it's not going to work for the audience. But if I play it like, hey, here's a guy who makes a bad decision and he's having the worst day of his life after that, then I can make this movie. Mm -hmm. I think it's fascinating because, you know." Richard Donner, according to him, he sees it as, hey, this is just a bunch of coincidences happening to this poor bastard Gregory Peck, you know? Yeah. I see it as, hey, this is the birth of all evil in this little kid, which is absolutely terrifying and creepy, you know? Oh, yeah. No, I mean, evil kid horror is, like, it's a staple of the genre. But, I mean, and I, I love the fact that I had forgotten, and I had actually forgotten that Damien, you know, and I, I don't want to get too much into spoilers, but like, 
I, I do did forget about the fact that the movie essentially turns on a lie. Yeah. It actually turns on two lies, but one lie in particular puts everything in motion, and you think that everything that's happened afterwards is basically because of that lie until you real until you come to realize the truth later. Yep. And it's just but one of the other quotes from a Donner I've always liked is the idea that he essentially wanted to make a movie that would convince people that Atticus Finch could kill a kid. <laughs> and and I, I I love that comparison because of the fact that, and it goes back to the verisimilitude where he, every movie that he makes is about creating an honest and real world around the characters that he's telling the story for. And you get that in The Omen. You get that in Superman. You get that in the Lethal Weapon movies, even. And where you get this, where where you get this world where Riggs and Murtaugh would not only become friends for life, but that Riggs would have a completely one hundred and eighty degree turn on whether he wants to live or die. And it's just so brilliant what he did in each of his films and being able to create an honest reality that we just believe. Well, look, here's the thing. When you're making a movie, you're building a world, right? Yeah. As a director. And you're compiling all these people, you get a cast together, you get a crew, you get a cinematographer, you get writers, you get this and that, right? There are only certain directors who are really good, great, I should say, really elite at world building. So when you build a world, like if a, if a film's constructed by a director the way it should be, I'm going to lose myself in that world while I'm watching that movie. You know, mm -hmm. I'm totally invested. I'm in that universe. It's like I could step out my front door and I'm standing right in the middle of the scene, you know? And Richard Donald was superb at that. You yeah. Know, he's great at creating all these different types of worlds. Like you said, you know, you get a lethal weapon, which isn't, you know, it's a, it's a comedy on one, on one end, but it's an action flick, you know, and you get this gritty, you know, stuff with Mr. Joshua and all these bad guys and all this stuff going on. And then you have that, but then you have Goonies, and Goonies is just this little seaside town, in, I think it's Oregon, it's either Oregon or, uh, yeah, it's Oregon, right? I, I think, think it, yeah, it's Oregon. I'm pretty sure it's in Oregon. You know, you get this little seaside, and you get this whole little community, and I feel like I'm one of those kids in that neighborhood, you know, because yeah. I think it was around 12 or 13 when that came out. So for me, again, I could step right into that. And the funny thing is, like, the great thing, the really great films, the ones I really love are the ones that I can see 30 years ago, right? And mm -hmm. I can watch yesterday like I did with The Omen. And The Omen still scares the hell out of me. It's still yeah. terrible, you know? I can watch Goonies and I feel like I'm, fuck, I'm, feel like I'm 13 all over again, you mm -hmm. know? I can step right into that. It's, it's just part, part of it's nostalgia, but part of it is, hey, listen, this is you know, part of who I was, and I can associate with these kids. Or, you know, I mean, Riggs, Riggs is suicidal. Riggs wants to die. You know, he wants to kill himself. Riggs mm -hmm. is also ready to give up. There are two characters that are ready to say, hey, there's not, there's not a lot for either one of us. You know, there's not enough for me on the police force to go to, there's not enough for me to live for from Riggs. And it's the union of those two guys together to combat Mr. Joshua and move on from there. Like it's mm -hmm. the best in the living, you know? And they're not ready to give up at the end of that film, and that's great. Yeah. No, it's, uh, it's in, I mean, Lethal Weapon, it's, it's, I, I think if I had to, if push came to shove, I, I think I would have to say the Lethal Weapon movies are, probably my favorites of his, or at least, and especially the first two, because I, I think the first two are the strongest. I mean, I, I, I've I always enjoyed the third one because it introduces Rene Russo's character as a foil for Mel, and she works so well off of uh, Mel that you you believe that they become a couple by the end of the movie. Sure. And, uh, you know, I, I've actually seen the fourth one a couple of times over the past year for a variety of reasons. I actually reviewed the fourth one for my 
credit review and then i actually watched it again for a podcast that i guessed it on and we talked about lethal weapon 4 but and yeah there's a lot of that story that doesn't work at all but you see movie you see scenes especially like the openings the first scene you see of uh Riggs and Lorna together and you buy them and it's it's a very authentic moment and there are other authentic moments throughout that film I uh, even even though the film itself is not that good and you can kind of tell that everybody is kind of spinning you know everybody is kind of just you know going through the motions to a certain extent yeah, they're coasting in that film absolutely yeah I mean, the, um, the thing is that, you know, especially now, like, A Quiet Place 2 came out a couple of weeks ago, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm like, and around the same time, Cruella came out. I'm like, okay, I don't need this sequel because the first story was really good and told everything it did, got in and out, and I don't need to see any more. Cruella, I'm like, I certainly don't need a prequel because you're going to try to make a dog-killing psychopath into, you know, some some sympathetic character, and I mean, I don't need a backstory on that, you know? But the thing is, if you're going to make prequels, you're going to make sequels, you should really have, you know, you should really have a, a more better reason than financial. You should really have it where you're going to develop characters, things are going to move along, you know, you're going to have changes in them. If you want to make prequels, you should have a reason for that, too. And the thing is that, you know, even though they got a little goofier every time they went, like, all four of the lethal weapons didn't just not have a purpose, you know? They weren't just like, hey, let's cash grab now. It's, hey, they used yeah. to go and, and, and Danny Glover and the other characters as they went, you know? Isn't Chris, isn't Chris Rock in the fourth one? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, and the thing is, it's like, it, the, the fourth one, there are things about that I really like. And it's like, it's one of the reasons why I kind of lamented the idea of, I, I've kind of lamented the idea of them actually doing a fifth one, which I hope gets laid to rest along with Richard Donner because I there's no need to see a fifth one of those because the story ended in as logical a place with the fourth one as you could get. Like by that point Riggs has done a complete 180. He's a father. He's married again and Murtaugh has the larger family that continues to build and build on his family and it's you know that last shot which is basically starts this sort of scrapbook of memories from the lethal weapon movies for the end credits it's it tells you everything you need to know why do we need to revisit those characters other than it being an ip grab well i have to ask did you see the lethal weapon television series I did actually, and I I will admit I actually I actually thought I actually thought there were some good things about it. Okay. Now, obviously, it wasn't as good as the series, the the movies, but I do think there was some there were some decent things about it, and especially with the dynamics of Damon Wayans and Clay Crawford playing Riggs and Murtaugh. So I, I thought they did a decent job of it. I mean, I I do think that it's one. I think they kind of got lightning in a bottle, and I think once, and I I know there were uh, production issues that came across with uh, Clay Crawford and stuff like that, and then he left, and then Damon Wayans left, and it, after that it was never going to sustain. So, but the fact is, it's like you know I especially a lethal weapon five that isn't that basically would bring back Riggs and Murtaugh when you've essentially finished their stories as much as you can I I don't think I, you don't need that type of legacy sequel for a movie like that no I mean and I know you're a huge Wes Craven fan and you know Scream 5 why yeah like the nice thing about the first four of those movies, and again, I, I, I go back and forth on, you know, and there are parts of each of them that I like and parts like, some of them that I don't like so much. But the yeah. that they were each Wes Craven's vision. So yeah. have somebody else just jump in years after he died and 10 years after that last one came out. I mean, why, you know? Mm -hmm. 
So well, hopefully, hopefully they'll put the weapon five to bed before it ever gets made. Yeah, that's that's what I'm hoping happens now that uh I mean, you know, it if you know, if you'd ask me, you know, and I even said it on the uh podcast where we were talking about lethal weapon forwards like you know what if it if it t- takes a lethal weapon five to get me one last film from richard donner i'll take it but that doesn't necessarily mean that i want it um but now that he's gone i definitely don't want it because i i think that because i don't think that series works without him as part of it because he's as important to that series is the actors. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, I, I actually just rewatched uh, Maverick this afternoon because I end it of all of the Gibson Donner uh, collaborations. It's the one that I hadn't seen the most. It's the one I hadn't seen in a while. And I, I forgot how much just pure joy is in that movie. And it's like, you can tell that Donner wanted to go all out on making that as fun a Western as possible. And I remember hearing some, hearing a quote of his when it came out that, cause I mean, you mentioned he, he directed a lot of television in the sixties and one of the shows he didn't get a chance to direct was Maverick. And so he looked at making the movie as an, a, as a sort of wish fulfillment of being able to direct an episode of that series. And it's just, it's so fun. And I, I think there was something about Donner who really kind of brings out the best in Mel Gibson as a performer. Whether it's the Lethal Weapon movies, whether it's Maverick, whether it's Conspiracy Theory you really feel like you're getting Mel Gibson's best whenever Donner directed him. Absolutely. And he, you know, that's not the only actor that I could say that for, you know, Lady Hawk, which is another one of his ones that didn't make so much money and isn't quite on the level of the other ones. But Rucka Howard is great in that movie. <laughs> Rucka Howard is a lot of fun in Lady Hawk. I, I will admit I have not seen Lady Hawk yet. Um, really? I did actually I did actually buy it during the last Warner Archive uh, sale, so I do own it, but I haven't had a chance to watch it yet. You know, I, I, you I am know, looking forward to doing so, though. Give that one a look and tell me what you think, because again, it's not one of his great films, but again, you know, Richard Donner never made a film that I didn't enjoy. I'll go back to that. You know, it's fun stuff, and he always found a way to. I always found a way to make me smile when I was watching one of his films. I never went out of his films and I was like, oh my God, that was awful. You know, I never never once thought of that, you know? Yeah. I mean, even, you know, I, you know, and you you said, you just said, and actually in one of the comments uh, was brought up that, you know, Donner brings out the best in a lot of people. I think that's just as true with, uh, I think that says true with Bruce Willis in his in Donner's last film, Sixteen Blocks, where like that's one of the best performances. That's one of the. I think that's one of the last really great performances that Bruce Willis has given. Um, Let's face it, Bruce Willis is a guy who's very talented and likes to coast. And Bruce, Bruce Willis is also very, from everything I've heard, you can ask Kevin Smith, very difficult to deal with. You know. Yeah. But Donner manages to pull a really great performance out of Bruce, Bruce Willis. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, it's it's a fun flick. Trying to watch him go those thirteen blocks. Yeah, yeah, and I mean, it seemed and like it really should have. That really should have been a Die Hard movie. That should have been the last Die Hard movie. Like they should have made that character John McClane, and they should have made him. And this is something I actually came from a podcast where we talked about because I brought up 16 blocks and I'll go back for 16 blocks any day of the week because I've always been a fan of it. And it's it really is like it really does strip that John McClain persona of Willis's down to a level of authenticity that the character that that type of character in 
for Willis hadn't really had since the original Die Hard. Sure. Well, and one of the nice things, even then, you know, we can we can definitely say that we went a long time without a Donna movie, and that's a shame. But the nice thing about it is that he and his wife continue to produce some really yeah. great stuff. I mean, they're a big part of why the X-Men franchise became what it became, you know? Mm-hmm. And you have that, you have, you know, like I, I know you mentioned on Facebook, The Lost Boys was one of them, you know, back in the 80s. Yeah. And, you know, it's nice to see that even though he wasn't directing, he and his wife, he and his wife were still involved in the creative process and bringing some really great stuff to the screen. Mm-hmm. I didn't realize I didn't realize he was an executive producer on any given Sunday, the Albert yep. Stone movie. Yep. And I had forgotten he had anything to do with Tales from the Crypt. I had really had forgotten that. Oh God, it was him, and it was I think Joel Silver was one of them. And Zemeckis was the uh, third part of that. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, I'm not a huge fan of the Tales from the Crypt series, but mm-hmm. I'm more a Tales from the Dark Side guy. But again, you know, it's, it's Donner doing his thing. Donner taking, you know, his, his executive producer spot, and you know, pushing along some fun stuff on HBO. Yeah. <laughs> And, of course, he produced the uh, Free Willy franchise, which, you know, <laughs> you know, I mean, there's there's not much to say about it. But, you know, the fact is, is you, you do see that, you know, even you, you do see that, you know, Donner's I, I think one of the, the great things about Donner and one of the things that really is come the, the one things that one of the things that was reminded of this past day as people started talking about Donner and remembering Donner is that he is just genuinely one of the nicest guys. And he, everything I've heard was that he was just one of the nicest guys, one of the nicest people. And that comes through in all of his films. And like you said, he's very much an optimist. You know, I, I met, I spent, from 2004 to 2014, I spent a lot of time going to horror conventions, right? Mm-hmm. And along that, especially toward 2010, 2011, I started to meet some people from The Omen, which was really cool. Yeah. Like I met the kid who played Damien, and I met David Warner. And oh, I got to say, the one person I was always hoping at, because I gave up on conventions around 2014, I always said the one guy who would get me back and he was doing a show, I would travel anywhere to meet and speak to would be Richard Donner. Yeah. Unfortunately, he never did one. But yeah, I mean, all I've ever heard, and if you watch, I've watched plenty of interviews with him over the years, where it's just like, he's just happy to be making films. He's happy to be talking about films. And he seems like a, yeah. little, like a genuinely nice guy, you know? Which is why it's a shame that, you know, he got screwed on Superman too. <laughs> you know, I mean, I love Superman too the way it is. I know a big portion of it is the Donner. I have not seen the Donner cut, have you? I have. It's it's interesting, um, but I haven't seen the original Superman two in ages. So I I need to I need to watch that at some point to see how I feel about that one. I mean, I like the Donner ver the Donner cut. I think it's good, um, but even then, it's still not completely the Donner cut because they're at, they had to use stuff that uh, Richard Lester directed. Yeah, they, they, they so put together from from the stuff they had left over. Yeah, I mean it's an you know it's an interesting curiosity, but yeah, I mean I it's you can't really say it's a genuine film either. It's more of it is more of a I guess a glorified. I mean it's essentially I I look at it as sort of like maybe the extended versions of the Lord of the Rings trilogy or any a director's cut or something like that. Even though it technically isn't, it's more. It, it's actually kind of actually a good comparison would probably be like the quote unquote "Love Conquers All" version of Brazil. Yeah. That Criterion is included on their uh, sets of Terry Gilliam's films. Sure. I mean, I just remember seeing it, and I'm like, and I, I, at the time, I had friends who bought the the collections on. I guess it was still DVD at the time. 
And I was yeah. telling them about it, and they were telling me about some of the changes. And I'm like, you know, I just don't think that after all these years that that's really what I was looking for, you know? Right. It would be nice had they allowed him to finish his, even if they couldn't stand the guy, if they just allowed him to finish his vision, you know, and moved on from there. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you hire somebody as a director, you trust that person, you put all kinds of money into things, and, you know, you have a guy who delivered an absolute blockbuster with the first Superman. Uh, I'll never forget this, Brian. Watching Superman 1, you know, Superman, theaters in 1978, and, you know, it's the end of the movie, and the end credits come up, and the first thing you see is Superman will return in Superman 2, and I lost my shit. You know? Yeah. <laughs> Little six year old Philly lost his shit over that. I'm like, yeah, <laughs> awesome. We're going to see another one. So, yeah, I mean, you know, it's just Donner, like I said, you know, he, not every film was on the level of a Superman or, a, you know, a lethal weapon. But, you know, he was a guy who obviously had not only his talents invested, but his heart invested yeah. in every film. And you can see that. You can see he cares for his characters, he cares for his craft, you know? And, you know, a, a, an optimism, I think, is the best way to put it. You know, we've talked about him being, I mentioned him being an optimist. I think that there's an optimism to every one of his films, you know? Mm -hmm. Right at the end, there's something that you can prove, well, maybe not the Omen, because the Omen ends pretty miserably for everybody. <laughs> yeah. As, as from Superman on, I think that, you know, there's, there's always that optimism. There's that, hey, look, the world's a the world might have looked shitty at the beginning of this film, but, you know, we're going to make our way through and it's not so bad, you know? Right. Have you ever seen, have you seen uh, Inside Moves? I have not seen that movie in years. Yeah, it's a long, long time ago. It's, it's, I, I, I finally, I actually got, uh, I actually got sort of introduced to it, I guess you could say through the uh, A's All Over podcast when they, review when they talked about that movie and i you know i don't i don't love the movie i think it's just very good but i do still have a genuine i do have a genuine affection for it and i mean it plays to that heart that richard donner has and you know it's it's even even in something like scrooge where like he 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 has his main character from by Bill Murray, who's just an asshole, but you can tell that he is, you you can tell that he's ultimately working towards, you know, taking, he's the right person to do that type of spin on A Christmas Carol, where you can get a character like, somebody like Bill Murray's character in that movie to a place where even if they haven't necessarily changed as much, you can at least feel like they appreciate things a bit more. Well, I mean, I have to say, and I can't believe we, we it took us this long to talk about Scrooge. Scrooge is my favorite Christmas movie. Absolutely bar none. Mm -hmm. You could take your Christmas vacation, Rudolph, and all, you can have all those flicks, you know? My thing is that, you know, first off, it's a great cast, okay? You have... yeah. Um, you have um, Bill Murray doing his douchebag Bill Murray thing, which, you know, by that point wasn't anything new. You have John Glover in there. You have, you know, John Fawcett. You have a, a whole slew of really talented actors in there. And that movie is really, really funny, you know? But yeah. Then, you know, you get to the end scene, and I know that a lot of people rip on the end scene, you know, but the problem, that's never been a problem for me because, you know, it's, it's all about heart at the end, you know, mm -hmm. that, hey, here's this guy, he was on, you know, he had a rough, you know, and I'm not making excuses for the character, but he had a rough childhood, you know, he got to a point where he made some bad decisions and thought that business was more important than love, you know, and, and there's those scenes with him and, and his girlfriend, or his ex-girlfriend, where, you know, he's supposed to go out for lunch to her, but hey, something's happening on the set, so he's got to run. Something more important. There's a luncheon or something like that. Hey, I'm going to meet the producers and all that stuff. Um, and the Bobcat go away scenes in that movie are hysterical. Yeah. <laughs> That's funny, funny stuff. 
when he grabs Bobcat, Bobcat's trying to mow him down with shotgun, and he grabs him and kisses him on the cheek. Mm. Oh my God, it's hysterical. But again, you know, I mean, you could say it's schmaltzy, you, you can go off on all you want. To me, it's just, it's a really nice movie. You know, yeah. Take, uh, someone who's, and if you look at what Scrooge is supposed to be, Scrooge is a miserable bastard. And at the end of The Christmas Carol, he turns around. That's, you know, the way it ran. I just love that flick. Mm hmm. Yeah. And you were, you know, and you were talking about Goonies earlier. And, uh, yeah, when I was, you know, when I was putting together my list of uh, 40 movies that sort of shaped my first 40 years when I was turning uh, 40 back in uh, 2017, you know, I was going back, there were some movies where I was going back and forth, whether I should have one or the other to sort of represent that type of movie. Like one example was I had, you know, in terms of like slasher movies, I was thinking either Friday the 13th or Predator. And I went it went with Predator because I really, I, first of all, I think Predator is just a better movie. Secondly, Predator's just been a movie that I've always loved since then. And, you know, I was in thinking about like sort of adventure coming of age type movies. I was thinking about either Goonies or Stand By Me. And I went with Goonies because of the fact that it was, it was more fun. It was some, I think it is something that as a kid, I certainly identified more with Goonies and it resonated more with me because of the sense of adventure. But even a few years out now, I think I'd probably prefer Stand By Me because that's more of a reflection of thinking back on youth as an adult. And like the Goonies is very much a from very much kind of from a kid's perspective on what that adventure looks like. And I still enjoy Goonies. My wife and I went to go see it last year at a pop up drive in that one of the art houses down here did, and it was it was fun. I I still really enjoyed that movie. I know it gets a lot of crap from older from younger generations, but it's like. Sorry, I still really enjoy that movie. The cast is strong. Donner does a great job of pacing the set pieces, not making the set pieces too overly scary with the Fratellis and the the booby traps. And it's just such a fun movie. I think it was the classic Cindy Lauper song. <laughs> Yeah, it really, I, I really do love that Cindy Lauper song. I don't um, know if you've seen this, but, and I think you could find it on YouTube. Uh, it must be 10 years ago or more. Donna got together with all the kids in the cast like 10 years ago, Sean Astin and, you know, um, Josh Brolin and a whole, like every one of them, I think, including Corey Feldman. And they actually did a commentary for that movie, all of them sitting in one yeah. room at one time. Yeah, that's a great, that's a lot of fun. Yeah. And I know last year when Josh Gad his was doing like his series of reunion videos on Zoom videos on YouTube last year, uh, as the pandemic did, one of the first ones he did was Goonies. And he got as much of the cast as he could get. Donner was there and Spielberg was there and they, you know, you would they went back and forth and talking about different scenes and stuff like that. Yeah, that cast has just a that cast and Donner just have wonderful chemistry between everybody. And, uh, you know, it's it's a shame, you know, to a certain extent, it's a shame that we didn't get a sequel, but at the same time, not everything has to have a sequel. Well, and that movie works because of the way it ends. Well, I mean, what, how, how would you make a sequel to that? Because you're either doing exactly the same thing and you don't need that. Like, that's just a retread. Or, like, I don't I don't quite figure out what the story would be there. You know, I like the way it ended. It just, it, yeah. And it served its purpose. And it was like, hey, here's where we began. Here's where we're ending. And the end was just about perfect for those characters. Well, I mean, I think I think the idea at one point was it was always it was always going to be like their kids would go on an adventure. Gotcha. And it's like, eh, that doesn't really, you know, it's like that doesn't really work because you want to see 
you want to see them together again. You don't necessarily want to see their kids going on an adventure. It's like, first of all, that's kind of a lazy way of doing like a legacy sequel to something like that, even though you wouldn't have necessarily called it that in like 2000 or so. But at the same time, it's like, no, you, like you said, the ending of that is perfectly fine because it's like they found One-Eyed Willie, they saved the they save the town and you know they they you know they they did what they set out to do and had an adventure doing it and uh it was adopted so it's all good <laughs> yeah exactly um <laughs> and so but, the superman shirt in that movie yeah <laughs> but um well i i uh you know i i think this is kind of a good place to uh stop i mean we you know i we could certainly go on i mean i i love i would it would be wonderful to talk about conspiracy theory which i really love and is some of i think is some of the best work gibson did for donner i would love to talk about you know assassins is a good movie and it it's i i like it, it's interesting it was interesting that Donner was able to work with a couple of other big 80s action icons other than Gibson in like Stallone in Assassins and Willis in 16 Blocks and come out with something kind of different for both of them from what they were so used to at their prime. I mean, even if I, I don't necessarily think Assassins holds up quite as well but i think it's still a it's still kind of a nifty you know action thriller for stallone sure well if i can make a quick closing statement here i'd like to say that you know like you said earlier at the beginning some you know i'm not really a cult of personality thing with the hollywood scene or music or any of that yeah once in a while you know a a performer or a director or an actor, you know, somebody dies and it hits you a little more than it would, you know, if it were just somebody else. And, you know, Donner is a great creative mind. And, you know, he had that warmth and optimism in every one of his films. And I'm going to miss him. I really yeah. So. Yeah. And uh, it's, you know, I, Donner, you know, and we didn't really even talk about him, his, his craft when it came to building action sequences, building set pieces, but like Donner is a filmmaker where I think he is, he, he is one of the best uh, action directors we've ever seen in Hollywood. I, I, I think there's plenty of evidence in the Lethal Weapon movies to back that up. I think if you look at the set pieces he did in Superman, the set pieces he did in assassins in 16 blocks and even in something like timeline he was always careful to understand the rules of shooting action and for me like he and john woo are above any other people making action movies now and even even when they don't necessarily have the best material you can always count on them to deliver something entertaining and exciting and i think and and i think that was and it's that's part of the reason why it kind of broke my heart that donner we never got one more film out of donner i mean it didn't even have to be an action movie it's like i would have loved to have seen him do something on a smaller level like an inside moves again well, it's funny that you mention action, though, because if you, even if you look at some of his non-action films, like one of the tensest two and a half minutes or so of the Omen is the graveyard scene. And when we do the Omen yeah. show, we'll talk about that in detail. But that is a perfectly laid out scene mm-hmm. from the way it's, it's written to the way it's shot, the cinematography, the music laid in, the way he captures the dogs on camera. 
Yeah. And if you look at Gurney's, all the stuff that happens on Why I Really Ship at the end, that, that whole Rube Goldberg thing, yeah. you know, that's an action, that's a big time action scene in this little kid's adventure movie, you know? So yeah, he was definitely great as far as, as, as action scenes go. I got to agree with you on that. Yeah, and uh, no, you the this that's one of the yeah, and we'll we'll talk more about the Omen when we uh, talk about that trilogy, but uh, yeah, I mean, oh god, that that scene just absolutely was that that movie that scene just absolutely blew me away watching it last night. I mean, even today watching uh, Maverick, like it's it's weird to see. In Maverick, if you haven't had a chance to see it in a while, uh, give it a rewatch because uh, Maverick, it's the way it begins is very interesting because you have you you establish Brett Maverick as a character, and then you have this like twenty minute sequence of him just playing cards, where you sort of get this idea the idea of what this character is about, and the 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 story proper hasn't even begun yet and it really doesn't until after that scene and that sequence and it's just a wonderful he he's so great at layering on exposition and character development and just building and even the and that sequence still but that sequence still sets up things that we'll see later in the movie, whether it's seen, whether it's the relationship Brad is going to have with Annabelle, and the fact that Jodie Foster didn't get cast in more comedies after that movie just absolutely astounds me. Rewatching her performance because she is fantastic in that movie, and then you establish Alfred Molina's character, and you sort of get an idea of what that character is about, and it's it's such a great sequence because of the fact that like the movie hasn't even technically begun yet, but the movie's begun and it's because of the, what the actors are doing. It's because of the way R William Goldman wrote that screenplay. And it's the way that Donner sets up, lays out that sequence that you just go with it. And you know, it's 30 minutes of a half of a two hour movie and you don't care because of the fact that you're just so engaged with what these guys are doing. It's wonderful. I do want to mention one thing before we go and you did mention Star Wars earlier, so I have justification for this. I'm always happy to tell people that Richard Donner said, I've seen him say this in a number of interviews, that Fox was in terrible shape at the time they put out the old like yeah, really, like they didn't have money, and then the woman came out that summer made a fortune for them. Yep, and they took some of that money and gave it to George Lucas to finish Star Wars. Mm -hmm. So, a big part of why Disney has this massive empire today is because of Richard Donner's the owner. <laughs> <laughs> I, right. I, I, I love that idea, and I, and you know, if you think about it though. He's responsible for very much more of the Disney Empire because of the fact that he's inspired pretty much every single filmmaker who's been a part of the MCU. So not only is Richard Donner responsible for the ability of Fox to complete Star Wars, he's also inspired the generation that's created the Marvel Cinematic Universe. And uh, so, yes, Richard Donner... Uh, God, God bless him, but he is uh, he 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 deserves some blame for uh, Disney at the <laughs> present time. No, of course he doesn't. That that's a terrible thing to say. Um, but yeah, it's it's it is funny to hear those. It is funny to see those coincidences. But the fact is, it's like you look at something like The Omen, you look at something like Star Wars, you look at the long shadow that both of those movies uh both of those movies and even something like the lethal weapon movies which basically redefine the define the buddy cop genre sure. that nobody else really duplicated quite as well and you see the fact that like even though he isn't one of the canonic uh great directors 
he he is he was a completely inf greatly influential director and um it's it's gonna be a, it's sad that it's sad that we didn't get more from him in the past 15 years but it really makes me glad for what we got from him in the 40 50 years before that he has a wonderful legacy that is well worth um enjoying yeah you know the, between the influence of what he's done and the catalog that he left behind i think richard donner is one of our country's great directors yeah I think that he doesn't get the credit he deserves mm -hmm. but i'm also glad that you and i were able to talk about him for an hour or so tonight Jeez. absolutely yeah um richard donner will definitely be missed and he's and but yeah like you said i mean the the legacy of his work and the work itself is still around and is still very much it's worth checking out and whether it's something like the omen that floats her boat whether it's superman whether it's lethal weapon or goonies or even something like you know, Timeline or Maverick. I mean, he he made films, he made films that were accessible to everybody. And I, I think that's, and he made films that were very populist. And I think that's, that's one of the other things that I think is sort of kind of forgotten with Donner because of the fact that it's like, he really, he, he, he does have that, um, he he's very much a popcorn filmmaker. He was very much a popcorn filmmaker, and, and there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, you know, Spielberg was that before he turned really serious. I mean, even then, he's still done some uh, lighter stuff that's still really just entertaining. But um, at the same time, it's like Donner was that with every film he did, and but he also he also worked on movies that he was passionate about and he was passionate about star wars he was passionate about making it work and the fact that he made it work as well as he did the fact they made the omen work as well as he did the omen could have easily been an exorcist knockoff oh absolutely and there's so many ways it could have gone sideways like that but the fact is it doesn't and no, it's and it's a, a tr credit to him that's a, a big part of that and i give the brunt of it is you know it's richard donner saying hey listen this is not just some cheesy horror flick i'm making here i'm not making some exploitation flick yeah I mean, like about a guy having the making a bad decision and having the worst day of his life you know mm -hmm. and i think that that shot that shades the entire movie that you know he wasn't, and then you get Gregory Peck and Lee Remick and Billy Whitelaw, and you have this great script, and you have Stuart Baird, who was his, his, his DP, is also his DP on Superman. So you collect this talent of actors and, and crew, and you know, it's a classy film. It's a yeah. classic horror film, and it works on me for every single level. Yeah. At every level, it, it fires on all cylinders for me. So. And and we will talk about more on that uh, come October, which will be when people will get to hear our discussion on the Omen trilogy. Uh, but Phil, thank you very much for joining me on this uh, for this tribute to Richard Donner and a filmmaker who means means a lot to both of us and means a lot to a lot of people. And it's uh, because, like I said, you know, I, I sent you a message on Facebook and I'm like, man, I wish we could do this podcast about the Omen trilogy tonight. Yeah, I, I really just want to talk about Richard Donner in a little more depth and detail in Facebook posts. Yeah, now, exactly. Would you like to join me on the podcast? I'm like, that's the greatest thing you could have asked me. So <laughs> I appreciate that as always, my friend. Oh, no problem. And thank you very much for uh the, watching this episode of the uh sonic cinema movie chat uh check me out continue to check me out on twitch and uh the sonic cinema podcast is on youtube apple Podcasts, google Podcasts, and spotify and you can always find my written work at www.sonic-cinema.com thank you very much